On First of the Best, we get to review the often overlooked or forgotten first film by some of cinema's best directors. We'll discuss how these legendary directors got their first opportunities to make their mark in cinema. These are the movies they cut their teeth and learned the filmmaking ropes of Hollywood. We'll take a look at how these filmmakers' careers evolved from here, as well as their signature style, cinematic trademarks, and thematic ideas that may have been prevalent right from their very first chance in the director's chair. So join Cinema Gulp in an appreciation for filmmakers that once you get a taste, we know you'll say, What's it is, your lips? It's so good! Welcome to Cinema Gulp, everyone. I'm Ben. And I'm John. And on this episode of First of the Best, I selected... Wes Anderson's first film from 1996, Bottle Rocket. And I selected Paul Thomas Anderson's first film from also 1996, Hard Eight. Let's, you know, point out the obvious, John. We selected these two. Yes, because they're both both pretty great filmmakers with great aesthetics, but they're both Andersons. So yes. it just made sense. Not related, though. Not just, related, uh, no. I think they have some similarities. They they sure. they have similarities to, to um, some of the aesthetics in their films, but they... Um, I think their storytelling is very different and the, and the, I guess the subject matters are, are very different. When you and I were watching Heart Eight, uh, we were talking about how, God, P.T. Anderson really knows how to make movies where you just don't know where they're going. And now that I think about it, that's pretty much the epitome of a Wes Anderson movie. You don't, I mean, yeah, Life Aquatic, yeah. you're, what is, where is this movie going? You know, like. And, and, and Bottle Rocket's the same thing. They're both uh, not plot driven, I would say. I mean, it doesn't mean there isn't a plot of some sort in their films, but um, they're definitely character driven, character studies. Um, and but but yeah, they're not strong on plot, and and that helps with you not necessarily knowing or being formulaic in any way where you're like, well, I can I can see where this is probably headed. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we're gonna start with the one that came out just a little bit beforehand, Wes Anderson's uh, Bottle Rocket. I don't know uh, how many people watching this have seen it or even know about it. I have talked to people that have not heard of this Wes Anderson movie because a lot of people think Royal Tannenbaums was the first, a lot of people think Rushmore was the first. Um, you know, it just, it works that way sometimes when things get buried. Sure. And then, you know, people like us, we like to go, well, you know, I remember hearing about him, you know, in 96, I didn't see Bottle Rocket when it first came out, but I remember people talking about it and seeing him, his little speech on the, on the MTV, movie awards where he told the little story that James Khan is the one that made the movie make sense from the title because they had said he goes why is this movie called Bottle Rocket hmm. and uh, Wes told him he goes well we just thought it sounded cool and then uh, James Khan said uh, you know to me it makes it makes sense because it's something big that starts out small like a small idea that starts out big and then they go wow that yeah, okay, that's why it's called Bottle Rockets. I, I always thought that was kind of a little interesting. Like, I love Wes Anderson. Uh, I, I don't I don't think that every one of his movies is is a perfect hit. Like, I, I mean, mo most of them are, but like, there's a couple, you know, Darjeeling for me is one that kind of stands out. But, uh, but for the most part, they're full of heart. They make me feel good. It shows how that spirit, like, because he's got this like symmetry and like, he's very eccentric and he's got this distinctive visual style narrative style a lot of people cited him as like the modern day example of a true auteur you know because because he does hold a visual style and editing style a quirkiness to every single thing he does you know no matter what period piece you know uh grand budapest or royal tannenbaums which is like this weird fantasy fictional like new york city you know like all that stuff has that has that aesthetic to it, and that's why I appreciate him so much. They are all sort of edited in that style with the uh, 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 Mark Allen Mother Spa sort of like um, soundtrack to them. Mm -hmm. But I think he's very aware of like, you know, a good example is Life Aquatic. When you know, spoilers, the movie's seventeen years old, but when they when, when they kill off Ned, and you're just like. You're sad and the movie goes sad from there and it just happens out of the blue where you think the movie's kind of already over mm -hmm. and like yeah i think he's written he did that in in grand budapest you're like the movie's over but then they give you one more scene and gustav is killed <laughs> you know like i mean off screen but they talk about it and it's like mm -hmm. he loves landing those gut punches um 
Richie, Richie Tannenbaum slicing his wrists out of the blue. Like he loves doing that kind of stuff. And I think he's very aware that like it, it shifts the movie more dramatically, you know? So we're, we'll, we'll get into Bottle Rocket um, and rewatching this one, John, because it'd been a it'd been a while for me, but it hadn't been that long. I think I saw it a couple years back, but um, watching it again and just focusing on it and taking notes, I forgot like how many like similar or he has the same kind of sensibilities, a lot of the same musical cues and stuff that he would use later. And I kind of remembered this one not doing that. Obviously, this one had like a smaller budget, so lots of the musical numbers are just they're not like he's not using Rolling Stones and Beatles yet at that point in his career because mm -hmm. those are hard to license. But it was fun to see that like that forward narrative editing that they use where it's they're talking about a scene and then someone closes a car door and then shows up at that scene. And, and it, it's pushing this like kind of goofy narrative along really quickly. Anderson thrusts you into this story where you meet these characters and they're all just sort of losers for their own. They're almost like living in like a Napoleon Dynamite type world where things are just kind of spinning in this weird, timeless environment. And uh, their Owen Wilson is like kind of self-proclaimed this like leader of, you know, them wanting to get into a life of crime. And they just think it's the coolest thing in the world. They haven't actually done anything yet. And he like he basically holds interviews with his friends to see who's going to be part of this gang. And they're gonna rob, uh, I guess, a bookstore. <laughs> like, and um, it starts out so fast, where you're already, you know, you're learning as they're talking about what they've already established. So it's not like the movie starts and then someone comes up with this idea. They're already kind of full speed ahead, wanting to go rob this bookstore because they wanted to get in the good graces of uh, James Kahn's character, who I can't remember uh, the name of the guy, I should. So so yeah, so they, they rob this bookstore and they just think they're awesome after that. Uh, and then they, they end up having to sort of go on the run, which I don't think they really needed to, but they just do because the whole movie is about them. It's, it's like they're children where they're having that adventure at the park. You know, like, uh, yeah. oh, God, we better we better go. We better go on the lamb and spend all the money on a hotel that we <laughs> that's just funny that you say that, because that's that's how I looked at it, too, especially like early on when you have Owen Wilson's character showing the plan that he's already come up with. And he has all these drawings and these notes in his <laughs> notebook or whatever. And it's like, yeah, it's stuff that a kid draws in class when they're avoiding paying attention to the lesson and they're coming up with what they're going to do in their their fort in the woods later that afternoon with their buddies or whatever and exactly yeah so you have kind of that childlike exuberance coming from especially Owen Wilson's character but Luke Wilson plays into it um you know like allows him to to live out those fantasies even when he knows like this is silly like at times he's one of my favorite parts of the film is is his story and and where it takes you um and while they're on this adventure or on the lamb on the run you know he kind of meets somebody and starts having this relationship and and he could care less about what owen wilson wants to do to prepare for the plan they're like we need to get haircuts and this and that and he's like yeah yeah you know let me know how it goes or whatever um so yeah that energy that comes through the characters the the childlike exuberance of of being on this adventure or whatever um i enjoy that that stuff Oh um, yeah, yeah. The, I, I my favorite line in the movie is, "He's out, you're out too." <laughs> I don't think I'm in. No yeah. gang. He's out. You're out too. And I don't Calm think down. I'm in either. No down. gang. It, it fit right in there with a lot of Wes Anderson's films that I admire. Them. Um, I love his unique style that he brings to cinema, but his humor doesn't always connect for me. Um, I was kind of actually annoyed with Owen Wilson's stupidity, even though I get it where it's coming from that kind of childlike place. Um, it's it's weird because I've, I've grown accustomed to Owen Wilson over the years, so I know what to expect from his style, but this character kind of rubs me the wrong way a little bit. Yeah, um, he, he can, he can so. easily, Owen Wilson's performances can easily fall into that like Vince Vaughn thing where it's like, you either get on board with it right away and it doesn't annoy you or like you're annoyed the whole time you know it's it yeah. really two two camps <laughs> the movie does veer in different directions like we we're talking about with both of these directors like mm -hmm. you know after this heist at the beginning they just go and they spend the, the the second act of this movie in a hotel where luke wilson meets i think her name was ursula uh who's just like I forget played by the cutest most pleasant cutest chick ever <laughs> like, yeah. i love that i love her, her i'm kind glad of you say that because 
I, I kind of wanted to point out how, like, just her looks, her her cute kind of homely looks or whatever work so well in the context of the story and, and their little love story. Um, for those who aren't aware of what we're talking about here, Luke Wilson's character falls in love with a, a maid at the hotel that they're staying at and just kind of follows her around as she does her daily chores. And it's just the cutest thing. Like they don't, they have the language barrier. She doesn't speak English, but they still only take about a day for them to kind of make this strong connection. And, and you believe it. Uh, with, with Absolutely the, believe it. Really well. But her, her looks, it's she's not some kind of like model or stunning, you know, Angelina Jolie style actress or anything, but her looks go a long way to make it believable the their the, the connection that they make in that short time and, and just yeah. the, the looks that she gives him. It's it's all about these facial expressions that the two share over this short time period where they're not able to really talk out their feelings. It's yeah. great. Yeah. My that, favorite part of the film for sure. Me too. Like that relationship, that little plot. That's probably the most uh, Wes Anderson in the movie. Like that's a Wes Anderson situation that he would create and possibly make a full movie out of, you know, which he kind of did. But I don't think I'd ever had that fantasy to that point. Like, oh, the maid, like I'm going to fall. I'm going to like charm the pants off the maid, literally. And uh, and uh, and when you watch the movie, like it really it's very engaging when he's just hanging out with her. And because it's very, it seems realistic. It's like he, you technically could just go and friend somebody that's doing their job at the hotel if you chose to do it and then fall in love with them. You know, uh, I've had, I've had relationships where the language was a problem too, you know, like, <clears throat> so I love, I love that stuff. And that's my favorite stuff in the movie too. It's more of sort of, I mean, it, it, there is funny things in there, like the montage of him following her around and helping her with the laundry and helping her make the bed and then meeting the other workers and all having margaritas like it's just cute and fun and that's that's really what i want to get to is like because yeah you have your heist stuff and that was the big thing in the 90s it's like oh we gotta have these screwballs doing a heist and it's gonna go yeah. wrong so that's that's wes anderson's like outside influences but the stuff that is the stuff that's great and that makes you feel like the rest of his career went more in that direction is that stuff with Ursula in the hotel. James Caan in your first film as like a, the, the draw kind of to bring people sure, in. Sure. Then you get Bill Murray in your second film and then you get Gene Hackman in your third film. I mean, he was really racking up these these legends to some degree in his first couple films. It's pretty impressive. Oh, God. Yeah. You look at the cast of Tannenbaums. It's I mean, Angelica Houston, uh, Danny Glover. It's just full of that of seems people. to be the that he has continued to draw from that cast in every every film after. For the most part, it's like once he got to Royal Tannenbaums, and I think you've said this before, that's the film where he finally became the Wes Anderson that we all know and love at this point. I forgot how many shots in Bottle Rocket like subliminally gave birth to a lot of stuff you would use later. And like, that's what the sort of the point of our show is talking about this stuff is like what worked and what didn't work in that mm. first movie. And like, though it's toned down a lot because I think he was trying things out in Bottle Rocket, he couldn't create that whimsical fantasy like world of whatever location that they're in. Cause it always feels like it's not the re it feels like it's like a parallel universe to wherever they're at you know like the life aquatic is the biggest fantasy ever that oceanographers or whatever are these like superheroes you know they're like mythologic it's yeah and he couldn't do that with bottle rocket so it doesn't pop visually like the other ones do because he's just shooting in regular locations uh i still think the camera work is nice um but it didn't focus as much on those details you know but you could tell yeah. he was learning those techniques and stuff. So, but I did notice, you know, n n now we're all very familiar with his kind of whip pans that he uses over and over in his films and the symmetric, you know, symmetry that he brings to his films. And that's the one that you don't see as much the symmetry uh, in this first film, but he still has a number of kind of the camera moves that, yeah. that you have grown to expect from his style. Um, and like other, like, close cutaways like i i, I want to say when they introduce the maid character it's like these cutaways of what she has on her cart really quick um and i feel like those are things you've seen in later films of his where he introduces a character or whatever and kind of uses these close-ups to help do that and uh his editing style and, and shooting style 
certainly was was apparent in this film. It's just I think the budget constraints kept him from, as you said, kind of creating that full out fantasy world. Yeah. Uh, and this whole movie was shot in Fort Worth, Texas, uh, which is probably why, again, it has a completely different color palette than the rest of the stuff. It's brighter. Fun fact, Bill Murray was actually the one they wanted to play Mr. Henry uh, before James Caan came along. Makes sense now that you think about it, but uh, I think for that role, they picked the right person. Or this was the only Wes Anderson movie where he did not uh, collaborate uh, with Randall Poster, who is the guy that is, he's one of the biz- biggest music supervisors in Hollywood. Uh, so he's the, he's the kind of music supervisor that he, when the script is being conceptualized, where it's just being written as a treatment, he's involved in that process. That's how important music is to Wes Anderson when he's making movies. So his music supervisor is that crucial to the whole development of in the pre-production. And I, I personally find that fascinating because if I became, if I was some big name director or something like that, I would have the same type of stuff he has that Tarantino has where music plays such a key role in how things how things are, are, are seen and how things are felt. So I love it that he has that with Randall Poster ever since I want to say Rushmore, but it's interesting. Well, obviously he didn't have it with this one because he was a, a student filmmaker pretty much. He was a brand new guy, you know, so you don't have those pieces yet. So, but I still, I really do. I think again, I forgot how much that stuff reminds me of his later work in Bottle Rocket. It still has cool musical cues that fit really well when the heist is going awry at the end and Owen Wilson's fumbling around and they're just screwing everything up and shooting themselves. You know, the musical cue in there is, is perfect. And that's kind of what fuels some of the laughter for me in those scenes. But what are you doing here? You're always at lunch now. That always. Yes, always. You know, doing this rewatch for first of the best uh, because I love Anderson's style. I just I really respect and appreciate how he sticks to his aesthetic and he's fine with his haters because the people that like his movies, I love that he's got such an amazing relationship with Fox Searchlight. Like they love him. He gives them so much cred and they and they give him the money that he needs. He's one of the most prolific directors with the budget they give him. He usually comes in under budget ahead of schedule and makes them profit, which is usually they say, I want to say four times what your budget is when you actually start making money. And he does that for them. And so they continue to trust him. And that's a fantastic thing, especially um, you know, when your career gets going and like you think you've reached the pinnacle of it and then you come out with Grand Budapest and it has this international appeal and ends up being his most successful movie to date and getting, I think, like 10 Oscar nominations or seven or eight or something. Of course, he's one of our one of our guys. Of course, we'll give him twenty five million dollars to make a movie that looks like it costs 70 million, you know, like and uh, and it also and it also gets people Oscar nominations for acting when they work with him, you know? So, uh, yeah, but and Bottle Rocket was the infancy of that. And I can see why he is who he is from Bottle Rocket. I really can more so than I thought I was going into this. So he's a filmmaker that needed to grow on me. And in fact, his first three films are not films that I still have a strong connection to. I think Rushmore is actually my favorite of those first three. Uh, But then once he got to Life Aquatic, I've, I've pretty much loved almost everything he's done except for the Darjeeling Unlimited or whatever. And really once we got to um, Tenenbaums and, and Life Aquatic, I think he his voice was very well understood by you know film goers and, and everything he's done. Very unique stuff since then, but it still all fits within kind of the mold we've seen him create for himself. But yeah, go see Bottle Rocket if you like Wes Anderson movies and you didn't even know this one existed. Um, or, if, or even if you did and you just didn't check it out, check it out. It's pretty interesting. If, if anything, the love story with the Ursula is uh, it's very warm and, 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 uh, and engaging. Okay, hard cut to hard eight. Now we're going to talk about Paul Thomas Anderson's first feature, which is hard eight. Uh, originally, he wanted it to be called Sydney, and it was based off of a short film that he made uh, when he was like in his early 20s. Um, he did get some known actors involved in the short that helped kind of get it seen by other people within the studio and stuff like that. Um, Philip Baker Hall was in the original short film. It was called Coffee and Cigarettes. Um, so he, I, it got some acclaim, I believe at like Sundance, which got him into some type of Sundance film program where they 
helped him raise the funds and, and craft the short into a, a full length feature. Um, so by about 94, he was working on the actual feature version of, of his short, calling it Sydney. He turned in a two and a half hour cut of the film. The studio hated it, felt it needed to be cut, took it out of his hands, made a version that was, was crappy, I guess. Um, so it took like two years for him in the studio to get on the same page and let him actually edit it into a version that that got a release um so it wasn't until 96 that it finally was released and only in a few theaters um it, it got some critical acclaim but it, it certainly wasn't a film that many people got a chance to see at the time and i think you know it had it had to take the success of boogie nights for him to get the name that that got people looking back and searching out that first feature and and now i think a lot of people um, if they're not familiar with it at least if they ever discover it realize yes this this truly is a a great place to start with the the paul thomas anderson filmography uh, he i think he had a a great film right out of the gate i really love heart eight and you know uh, we forgot to mention uh bottle rocket technically i guess was uh based on a short that wes anderson did too so it's interesting that both of these first films were years before based on um, on uh, on short films yeah. part eight um is kind of a crime story uh it's it's the tale of a aging gambler kind of hitman gangster style character philip baker hall who um wants to make amends for his past which we you know don't don't get to know until later in the story but he wants to make amends with his past and um help out kind of a lonely loser played by john c Riley that he finds at a cafe that's where the film picks up much like films of that era that you know gained popularity because of quentin tarantino in the mid 90s it's a film filled with just a lot of dialogue scenes character study mainly um light on you know what you would call action but the the film is still very intense at times um kind of keeps you on the edge of your seat even though it's not a film that that you know comes with a ton of violence but there is some in the film it is a crime story great cast philip baker hall and john c Riley are, are the main leads and this kind of father-son relationship that that grows out of this chance meeting or this maybe not a chance meeting but this this meeting where philip baker hall decides to show john c Riley the ropes in the casino world on how to make just a couple hundred dollars last all day and and kind of show the casino that you're there spending money and then they start comping you so he kind of shows them the tricks on how to game the system at the casinos and then it jumps forward two years and you start to see this blossoming relationship between John C. Riley and Gwyneth Paltrow's character, who's a, a cocktail waitress and sometimes prostitute on the side. Um, and they start their relationship. And then you've got uh, Samuel L. Jackson, who befriends John C. Riley's character. And the two of them, you could tell there might be something criminal going on between the two of them. And, and kind of got to see where these four lives are, are going to intersect and, and where the, the crime element of the story kind of comes into play later in the film but everyone's great great performances by all almost oscar worthy by most of them um samuel jackson is very much a samuel jackson character but we love him for playing those characters i mean he's he's awesome in this this movie and then the one other person i want to mention uh, cast wise is um uh, why am i blanking on his name right now are you talking about uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I can want to say Philip Baker Hall. Philip Seymour Hoffman has a cameo, but oh you will never forget God. it. It was a great, great standout moment in the film. Uh, no, I, I think it's one of my favorite Paul Thomas Anderson movies, to be honest with you. And I'll be honest with everybody watching. I just saw it for the first time with you. <laughs> you know, like, I didn't know this movie existed, which is what I love about this show. I, you know, I call myself a movie buff and I had not seen Paul Tur Thomas Anderson's first movie. It just slipped through the cracks, uh, but it's I enjoyed it. Sometimes it's not an easy one to, to seek out. I enjoyed the hell out of it, though. It's definitely one of his easy to digest, his easiest to digest films. Like it's very linear based. And uh, even though the story goes in weird directions, I mean, once you get to that hotel room, you're like, what is happening? What is going on with this movie? You know, when the situation the hotel is happening it's just like but but i love that stuff because it's 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 got you it's got you kind of like 
short of breath, but not because there's some crazy action happening. It's because what is going to happen to these people? And I, I agree with you. The cast of this movie is so good. Like you got the super young John C. Riley, the super young, super hot Gwyneth Paltrow. You got uh, Samuel L. I'm guessing fresh off of Pulp Fiction when they shot it. Um, but a very he's a he's a classic Samuel Jackson character, but he also is a little bit more subtle, a little bit calmer. He's got the I mean, come on, man, yo, baby, show me that pussy, show me that pussy. It's like, did he write that or did they write that knowing it was Samuel Jackson? <laughs> yeah. You got to remember the time. Like both of these movies were made. We're doing, you know, this show. I think it's got the two movies we're talking about the closest together in time. I think. And it's interesting that what was go where these guys' careers went and what's going on in the '90s at the time that these two look at what look at what Paul Thomas Anderson went on to do. Like, you know, Hard Eight came out again, same time with uh, Bottle Rocket, where you had that Tarantino craze. So it kind of feels like it's more like that. And this movie, Hard Eight, is so I don't want to say mellow, but it's just like telling a kind of a quiet story. You know, just letting yeah, it unfold. I think it's filled with like a lot of quiet tension. Um, like, like it does keep you kind of on the edge of your seat. You're you're tense for most of the the viewing experience, but it's it's kind of an understated amount of tension. And he's I think he's mastered that across all of his films. Uh, most of his films, not to say there aren't life and death stakes in in many of his films, but that's not always what the tension is being built off of. Is is someone's life hanging in the balance? It's it's just these quiet character moments and what decision will somebody make um, or how will, how will their decision play out for somebody else in the film? And that has you on the edge of your seat. And yeah, I, I feel like he's, he's kind of like a um, melancholy Tarantino. He's, he's not Tarantino brings like this upbeat energy and excitement and vibrance to his, his films. And they're filled with, with violence and life and death stakes. Whereas you get a lot of that in Paul Thomas Anderson's films, but they're not as not as violent, not as life and death, not as um, over the top. It's this kind of subtle, uh, melancholy kind of, of tension, and ex there's still excitement in the films, but it's it's subdued. The melancholy Tarantino is like a brilliant description of Paul Thomas Anderson. <laughs> really, really, really is. You talked about which may be one of the best cameos of all the time, but it wasn't really a cameo. It was just a part for an actor that wasn't anybody yet. Philip Seymour Hoffman just literally taking what you can tell was almost no little to no dialogue and just a uh, be an obnoxious guy, you know, like watching him at work and his young career just take that role and chew the fuck out of it for like two or three minutes was was so amazing. <laughs> Both of these Anderson guys um, have helped launch many people's careers um, who are still working today, who are, you know, well respected actors that that started out, you know, in the early days in their films and are still working with them to this date. So um, I, I love both these directors for the way that they've kind of crafted this uh, group of actors that they keep coming back to. I, I, I love that with many directors. I mean, James Cameron had a lot of actors that he would bring back from film to film. And it yeah. just it makes their world you know, that much more of an interesting little microcosm of, you know, I, I really appreciate that when a director can keep bringing the same actors back, but create new characters and new new cinematic, cinematic lives for them, basically. Like each character is a chance to have a new spot in, in cinema history, um, crafting these, these memorable characters. And I think both these directors do that over and over, even though they're using the same actor, they're, they're always able to kind of create something new using that something new out of something old. I don't know. It's 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 always an interesting approach. Well, I would say P.T. Anderson, Wes Anderson, Tarantino, like the thing I love about them using what Samuel Jackson calls the the team players, like the Tarantino players, like um, is like because from movie to movie, you never know how significant of a role is this character going to have when in the last movie they were the main character like i love watching that in wes anderson movies where bill murray's in two minutes of one and then he's the lead in the next you know and it and and they circulate these actors and pt anderson does the same thing too like i mean eventually philip seymour hoffman graduated to leading role status with stuff like the master you know, yeah. and that's that's incredible going from a cameo or a, a, a minute long scene in this 
to smaller roles and then getting bigger and bigger and then leading the master pretty much like that's mm -hmm. extraordinary and when you can turn an actor like philip seymour hoffman let's call him like a steve buscemi yeah or like a paul giamatti like just kind of like non-traditional stars yeah someone without leading man good looks yeah yeah like and when you can do that that's that says a lot about your direction i think too so yeah but speaking of his characters uh paul thomas anderson he he always focuses on kind of lonely kind of sad sack kind of characters i feel like or, or many of his films especially in his early first four films that this one hard eight is no different john c Reilly fits the description perfectly of you know characters that you you've come to love from him whether it's you know mark Wahlberg's character and so many people in boogie nights almost everybody in magnolia has that kind of effect um he definitely got the best performance out of marky mark to me to date in boogie nights i don't think there's even close to anything as good as that maybe people are setting off the plants no not really and and also uh, kind of mm -hmm. the same i would say for um adam sandler i mean i know he's tried a couple other more serious style roles but if you really look at his probably best dramatic performance even though it still has the comedy going on a bit punch drunk love is is amazing that that's adam sandler in the lead role there and and how compelling of a film and a character he is when it's you know donkey boy or whatever the fuck this guy's name because <laughs> that was the height of the sandler songs where he anything he touched made 500 million dollars even if it was a complete piece of shit so yeah. for him to go and do something like that and you know for pt anderson to get that performance out of him was pretty great i actually love that movie so but other things that i'd say show up in in heart eight that you see in a lot of other uh, paul thomas anderson films later he's got a he focuses on the theme of the family a lot, the family unit, and um, even to some degree, father figures. I think are are used a lot in his films. Um, definitely, the, you know, the family unit is an important part of Boogie Nights. You got the you know father and son kind of connection in films right there, like Heart Eight and and There Will Be Blood. Um, I think it's something that he's he's kind of focused on many times. Is that just knowing like the connection you have with your family is far more important than fame and fortune and and what what the desires that on the surface for the character what do you think that they want or what everyone thinks they want out of life um i think his films show that really it's more about the personal connections and the family connections even if it's not your real family i mean even in that image right there neither one of those are actual father and son i think that's something that was apparent in this first film that, that has traveled through with all of his films yeah, he just crafts really complex character studies that, that I find to be really interesting. As we said, they're not really plot driven, but I'm always compelled to follow this character all, all the way to the end of their story. Grabs you and, and keeps you interested, even if they're slow paced, slow moving, you don't know where the story's going. Um, even scenes can be drawn out to be these really long, exaggerated moments that you're like, when is this going to end? What is really the purpose? Sometimes it takes two viewings to, to fully grasp what was going on throughout the whole thing, but um, they're always very rewarding films for me. I, I feel like almost every film he's made has been top tier, best picture quality for me, except for Inherent Vice. It, it definitely has the stamp of someone who's gonna go on and win Oscars, 100%, you know? Uh, and where his career went, like he he's such a profoundly interesting director because you don't know what he's going to make from one thing to the next everything's sort of drastically different from one another i guess you could say companion pieces would maybe be boogie nights and magnolia because they were back to back and they have a similar editing style to them that keeps them sort of i don't know like fast paced uh, they're very different movies but and there's so many of the actors even though he's used a lot of actors across films those two really do have like similar casts yeah they feel like companion pieces and I, I feel like There Will Be Blood is what slowed him down and he, he really started exploring new types of techniques that he would almost even like revolutionize, you know, when he did the risks he would take in movies like that to make it as gorgeous and like golden era as it looks. Um, yeah. And then obviously I'm a huge fan of The Master. I guess I guess it was controversial. Like some people didn't like it. Some people did. I loved The Master. I thought it got two, the two best performances of the year out that year um maybe even three uh, amy adams was great too these guys are creating their craft and just learning how to make a film and that which is hard enough to do as it is that's why it takes you several movies to get what you would later call maybe your look or aesthetic or whatever but out of all his movies because you've seen them all which is the one where you think you see the most hard aid in 
Well, probably the first two, Boogie Nights and Magnolia. He was still that's what I was from say. that same framework here with with Hard Eight. It's just <clears throat> again budgetary constraints and things of that nature keep it a smaller film, a bit more contained than what later films are able to be or more ambitious. He kind of came out of the gate as a fully formed filmmaker, in my opinion. Like this, this film feels like it has everything you want from a, a Paul Thomas Anderson movie, and even though it's a small independent film mid 90s independent film um it, it it it's telling a small story so it doesn't feel like it's working under where oh it could be bigger if it wanted to be it doesn't need to be it tells no. the story it wanted to tell both of these filmmakers again both andersons have moments in their film where the camera draws attention to itself in the way that the whip pans or with paul thomas anderson he has a lot of push in or dolly into a shot or dolly out to some degree. And the speed at which he does that kind of feels unnatural to where it draws attention to itself. And and so many times when I see that in a film, especially if they only do it like once or twice and it really stands out and they're like, ah, eh, that took me out of the movie. It annoyed me. I don't like their camera work because, because you are aware of like, you feel the cameraman on set because it draws attention to itself. Yeah. Both of these filmmakers do it and have ingrained it into their style in such a way that it doesn't, it draws attention to itself, but doesn't take you out of the movie. It informs yeah. the story. It's, it's the camera work is playing into character development or storytelling in a way where it still keeps you compelled and interested and not have that momentary, oh, I'm out of the film for a second because I'm paying attention to their camera work. It's like a really well-crafted transition between from one scene to the next you know someone is putting that together someone's editing that someone's creating that it's not natural to have a transition because it takes you out of the story but sometimes it works in the context of the movie so well that like it, you're right it doesn't take you out uh wes is a great example of his whip pans because it's never forced it's always to support something happening so it doesn't take you out even if you especially a casual viewer I don't even know what they're seeing. Like you and I will look at it and go, yep, there they go. You know, they're doing it again. <laughs> but uh, but no, it's it's like a well-crafted transition. It's the same type of thing. You're supposed to not draw attention to yourself, but sometimes when you do, as long as it's good, then it still works, you know? The similarities or are, are these filmmakers really that similar or not? And I feel like that's definitely one of the areas they have their distinctive camera work that, that can be, um, you know, draw attention to itself, but works so well with their style. And then their production design, as we've you know pointed on many times about Wes Anderson, how it's one of the key key things that tells you you're watching a Wes Anderson movie. I think Paul Thomas Anderson's production design is is pretty amazing as well. But it's it's not as showy. Obviously, it's not creating kind of a fantasy world. It's it's more of a real lived in world. But if you if you think of all the different stories he's told and the different time periods that he's brought to the screen, it's pretty diverse, and they've all had kind of a, a, a similar feel within you know different story d different time periods but still you can kind of look at it and go that feels very much like a paul thomas anderson oh yeah film. well he'll, he'll have sort of ugly locations but it's it's a the texturized nature of the, the lighting and the film that makes like there will be blood is a good example of that like ugly gross oil fields but he just makes them look fucking epic and beautiful, you know, like yeah, dust and dirt. And it's a beautiful, beautiful film. It's yeah, he does that great job because the first movie I ever saw of his was Boogie Nights. Uh, and uh, there's a conversation that John C. Riley has with Marky Mark out by the pool. He's like, oh, can I make you margarita? Hey, do you know karate? You know, like uh, where that whole thing, you're like, I'm understanding these this, this guy's character right now and that he's going to end up being Dirk sidekick, you know, and it, I, I love when P.T. Anderson does, and he does that a lot in Hard Eight, where it's just these side conversations to explain where someone's head is at, you know, uh, or explain that they're just not the brightest person in the world, but we're following this person. Do you think that scene in Boogie Nights where the two of them meet and have that conversation w was like the impetus for Step Brothers? Because it just. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dale. You have to call me Dragon. This is something I wanted to quickly ask you with both filmmakers. Like, what what is your favorite film? We can maybe talk about what our least favorite is as well. Usually that's the ones we haven't seen or only watched once. But um, I'd say Boogie Nights is still my favorite. And so it is kind of like this high watermark early in his career that he hasn't quite gotten back to. But 
I, I think almost every film he's made since then is is just just a tiny bit below it. It's not like he's has this one that's so high on the mountain that the others can't quite get there. Because I, I, I seriously love There Will Be Blood. Boogie Nights is my favorite of his. Inherent Vice is my least favorite. What would you you go with for your favorites? Uh, Boogie Nights is my favorite. Yeah, uh, it's definitely followed by Punch Drunk Love. And then I got it before it would be Magnolia, but I might like Hard Eight more than Magnolia. Okay, what's your favorite and least favorite of Wes Anderson? <sighs> least favorite is Darjeeling uh, Limited. And I always say it wrong, Darji. Yeah, you know which one I'm talking about. Um, I, I have a very difficult time with this question because Life, I have two separate categories. I have Life Aquatic and um, Royal Tannenbaum's Tide as my favorite. And then as my second favorite, I have Moonrise Kingdom and Grand Budapest Tide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest edge to Tannenbaum's. And I know you disagree with that because it's not as inventive or as original or as unique as something like Life Aquatic. And I don't like Life Aquatic any less. I just I get the feels when I watch Tannenbaums. It just hits me in all those right spots, uh, which is interesting that you're not a fan of that movie because it's it's such an important movie to me. It's in my top 20 of all time. Like, I just love that movie so much. They're, they're subtle jokes. They, you know, they like, said, Daddy, they why wasn't I invited to grandma's birthday? Well, she wasn't your real grandma. I didn't think you'd have any interest in that. <laughs> sort of thing. I actually would say I, I kind of have two films as well that I want to pick for for my favorite of his because they're both i'd say the funniest at least for me the ones that i could truly say are comedies that i laugh at but um life aquatic definitely the funniest one it's his funniest um, movie but there's something about moonrise kingdom for me that is like a more polished feature maybe even more of a compelling story like there's the character of steve zisu is more compelling and interesting but the the journey that you take with the little kids uh and the parents surrounding them who are searching for them in moonrise kingdom is is almost more a rewarding uh journey i guess as a story so i kind of almost lean towards moonrise kingdom as my favorite of his but it's hard not to say that steve zizu as a character and all the quirkiness of that film that was the first wes anderson film that i truly got on board and enjoyed and was like oh boy wes anderson a filmmaker now that i'm i'm really interested to see his next work before Get that your red like, cap and a speedo oh, <laughs> oh I'm, I'm hanging on to my seat for for the french dispatch because it's just been pushed so many times and they've been so adamant and wes anderson's done such a great job of going please do not put this out on streaming because Last thing I'll say about Anderson is a lot of, and I, I said this on someone else's show once too, when we were talking about uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, and a lot of people think that because he's more of like an indie darling, that his stuff is okay to just watch on a regular television stuff. No, and, and if, if anything, his movies are so crafted and detailed and the way the sets are built and the way they use so much forced perspective to make things look bigger and he still uses matte paintings and there's so much color in his movies if anything i would say his movies almost as much as your blockbusters need to be seen on the big screen to really get the effect of them so yeah. uh, i'm glad he stuck to his guns and fought really hard for them to not put it on a streaming so i just hope it comes out next month in october so bad and it's also got a lot of new, it's got a lot of new people to Wes Anderson's acting team. You know, it's got like yeah. Timothy Chalamet and it's got Benicio Del Toro. That's like, the one that I'm kind of excited because he's such a quirky actor. He can yeah. turn in very interesting roles. Totally, uh, totally fits so, in Wes Anderson movies. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm excited for that. Thanks for watching. First of the best, everyone. I'm the Anderson Boys. And John, this is a special show because for five and a half years now, We've had a sign off on the show. What yeah, was the yeah. sign off? So that sign off has been We Drink Your Cinema. Um, obviously, if you're a Paul Thomas Anderson fan, you know that reference, you know where it comes from. But uh, yeah, that that's just been a kind of a special thing for us over the last few years. If we feel like it's really grown on us and grown on our channel. And um, it was exciting getting to watch that film again recently and kind of hear that within the context of the film. Don't forget to like, subscribe, tell your friends, hit that bell. John, where can they find us? Look for us under Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Look for us under Cinema Gulp. And until then, I'm John. And I'm Ben. And I drink your 
milkshake. I drink it up. <laughs>